The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I really uh, hate the end of the legislative session for one particular reason, because you get tired and your uh, emotional reserves go and you start getting emotional in public, which is like my least favorite thing. <laughs> um, there's a reason my children call me Stoneheart. <laughs> and it is because I think that we have to bring our very best to the work that we do and to our lives. We need to be driven by our passion, <clears throat> our passions and our feelings, but we need to have the discipline, the control, the thoughtfulness to channel that into being our very best selves. And I don't like it <laughs> when my reserves run low. So I just want to uh, say, first of all, I've already given a retirement speech. I don't intend to uh, share with you my journey, to the, how I got here, or uh, what those particular feelings are. What I'd like to do instead is talk a little bit about the last four years and how we leave this institution. When I was first elected majority leader, uh, I had a dinner on behalf of Joyce Pepin, who was the outgoing majority leader. We invited every single person alive who had ever served in this role, and none of them had served more than four years. Uh, so I figured out pretty early on that I had a shelf life in this job, and the more that I did it, I realized why. <laughs> I'll get to that in a bit. I want to first say that this is a very strange place. People bring all this emotion, there's this sense of drama at the end of session, this feeling that what we do is so consequential, that human lives are in our hands. And when our family and friends come here, what they most often say is, that's really boring. <laughs> what a dull place. You know how disappointing it is to pour your heart and soul into something and have people, kids in the gallery up here watch it and they're like, are we done? Can we get out of here? Like, we have one fan, and he's right up there right now. <laughs> uh, but it is a peculiar place. It's a peculiar group of people who are attracted to it. Uh, we now make, on average, you know, $45,000 a year for a salary. We work for months and months on end to get elected. We raise, we do, like, things that normal people would never do. We call up family and friends and ask for money. Please give me money so I can go and do something. We go door to door to knock on and to interrupt people's lives, to try to talk to them about stuff they mostly don't want to talk to us about. And we do it so that we can come here, work for five months out of the year, build these giant sandcastles of hopes and dreams, all to have them washed away at the end of session every single year. <laughs> then we go home and we think, you know what? I want to do that all over again. <laughs> And I'm one of them. I came back. And I have loved it, and I would probably come back a third time, although I hope the break is longer. <laughs> we have done good work here. Uh, this institution is what we make it. It is nothing else. It is a human place. Uh, Speaker Hortman, you have made it more humane. And when I first got here, I thought this place was nuts. I would sit here for endless hours of debate and listen to people say the same things over and over and over again, and I feel exactly the same way right now. <laughs> but at least we don't do it after midnight anymore, and that is because of Melissa Hortman. We've often said great things about the House staff, and we have often stood to applaud them, and we should do that. We have incredible people who work for us. We have not always paid them the way they should be paid. And we have made an effort in the last four years to take the political risk to increase the budget of the House of Representatives so that the people who work here actually make a decent wage. And we started with the people who've made the least because that is our basic job as employers, and that took all of us having the courage to say, we're not afraid of the politics, we are going to do right by these people.
We've also done something, we've never done this before, uh, and this was pre-pandemic. We had enough trust across the aisle. The leadership on, uh, uh, with uh, Minority Leader Doubt, and what is your title? Deputy Minority Leader? We, have, we all make up these titles, just so everybody knows, both sides. <laughs> Deputy Minority Leader uh, New Brindley, uh, Speaker Hortman, the front desk staff. We shut everything down, we sent you all home, and we decided that we could close out a session and take a mes message from the Senate without having to hold people in reserve because we were afraid of what might happen. We decided that it's okay to tell you what our plans are and to warn you when we think this one is uh, not germane, this one is out of order, we're gonna take up these bills first. That never used to happen. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are some House staff who still think it maybe should not happen. <laughs> but in politics, I have a simple rule, which is if it costs you nothing, give it away. Give away everything that is free. It will eventually come back. And I think we've built a lot of trust across the aisle um, on how we run this place. So I want to first uh, recognize Susan Klosmore, the executive director of the Republican side, Gavin Hansen for always being here and being a good voice, a reasonable calm, uh, Brian Cook, who is gone, but we held this place together here. <laughs> Through some very hard times. I'm gonna to try to keep going into this. The first day we met, post or in the pandemic, when you were all home, it felt like death in here. It felt like the world had ended. And we had to find the strength to continue on, and we did. And we could not have done that without the cooperation of the Republican members and staff. I want to say thank you for being our partners through that time. We also looked out for the health of our staff, and we fought political battles over what that meant. Uh, that was not our finest moment, in my opinion. We should not have ever made the health of our staff, our employees, and our fellow members a political question. And I'm not saying that is all anybody's fault, but that's how our politics is today. If one person takes a position, the other side has to say you're wrong, and I'm going to take the opposite view, and it feeds on itself. But we did, through our leadership, protect the health of the staff. We put that paramount, in, um, and it was worthwhile. One of the ways that we did that, and I'm really excited about this, we created House Rule 10, Emergency House Operations. And my favorite part about House Rule 10, 10.01, is paragraph D. It says, this rule sunsets the day following the last day of the 92nd regular session. That means, once we adjourn today, there is no more remote legislating, and it should not happen. We don't work as well. We do not work as well sitting at home. We cannot represent Mankato. We cannot represent Bemidji. We cannot represent St. Louis Park. We cannot represent Minneapolis as well at home in our districts. We need to be here amongst people in order to do it well. We do have to find a way to accommodate people who want to testify from distant places. There are thing, lessons to be learned, but we need to be present amongst ourselves in order to make this place function. The last thing I would say on that is, we also need to make sure that this continues to be a place where families are welcome, where children are welcome, where people can have uh, family present. We have lost, just this weekend, or in the last week on the House, side, House DFL side, we have had a child born and a father lost. We can never forget the importance of centering the families that we all bring into this work in this place. That's why we should have food on the floor. That is why we should be able to have kids on the floor. That is why we should be able to bring the people who are closest us, to us into this work. <laughs> and
And I just also uh, would like to say, that on the last final, uh, we also have to be ready. This is my blue folder. This is the uh, nuclear football, if you will, of the House of Representatives. I've had this ready since day one, moving the previous question. This is a, co a cooperative and a collaborative effort. I never wanted to move the previous question, but it is always the responsibility of the majority to pass legislation and do the business of the people of the state. You on the Republican side have cooperated with us enough to make this unnecessary, and that too is a change from the past. We should not do it, but we should always be ready. I also want to challenge us though, because we are not everything that we could be. The House of Representatives is not everything that it could be. We face a state that is far more complex than it was when the annual legislature was created in 1970. Not only are we a much more diverse state, we are a larger state, our economy is more complex, our regulatory structure is greater, all of our state agencies are far larger and do far more. Our local governments operate all the time year round. They have more lobbyists coming to us than uh, almost anybody else. We have a judicial branch that is active full time all the time. And the Minnesota House of Representatives is the most direct link between the people of this state and their state government. We do not have enough time to do all of their business on the schedule that we have. We do not have enough time to provide the oversight that we need of our agencies and our local governments. We do not have enough time to dive deep into budgets and truly understand the impact, impact of what we do. And as much as it pains me to say it, Gene Pulowski is right. Introducing 5,000 bills is not a sign of good legislative work. It is a sign that we have become a bill factory and think that it's only our job to churn through more. We need a full-time legislature. We don't need to pass bills all year, but we at least need to recognize that the people who do the best work around here work all year long, and they don't do it for any compensation. We don't have the support structure to allow us to do oversight, to understand the impacts of budgets, and to truly do the work of the public. And I think there is no question that as we look to the next generation of legislation, the next generation of state government, we need to be ready to meet the needs of the people. And the Minnesota House of Representatives is their direct link. And if we are not operating on a year-round basis, we are just giving up their power and giving it to people who are not directly accountable. That's us, and we should be doing it all the time. I also want to say that Minnesota government can be better. We have a tradition, a great tradition, born out of an earlier era, a nonpartisan tradition. On our side, the Farmer Labor Party and the DFL Party were agrarian. They believed that the average person could govern their own lives if they were given a fair opportunity to do so, and massive corporate power was a barrier to that. On the Republican side, you have believed that an administrative state that regulates every single thing that people do is also a barrier to what people can be and do. We need to look at our institutions anew all the time. We need to understand that what we have built in the past is not going to necessarily work for the future. We are an immensely more diverse state than we have been in the past. We are a state that looks like the rest of the nation. We need to be able to update our institutions and our traditions, our communities, our neighborhoods, and our families to welcome everybody in. If we cannot find the common ground, in the work we do in government to renew our institutions to meet those needs, Minnesota will not be a miracle state, it will be a mediocre state. I didn't sign up for that. So I think that we can do better. We need the work of this institution to reflect the expectations of our constituents, of the people who sent us here, that this matters, that their government is expected to work for them, it is supposed to work according to the very highest standards, and we are expected to do the work even when it is difficult, even when it is personally challenging, even when it makes you want to cry, you still have to show up and do it and keep doing it. And I just want to close with something uh, personal to me, uh, and that is what it takes to be a leader. Uh, I've learned a lot from these people, a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot from you too. But one of the things I, uh, I think is most important is to be self-reflective and to be a critical thinker about yourself and the situation that you're in. And when I was thinking about how to fill this job, I had to first understand 
what it is that Melissa would want me to do that could be of any value. And in recent days, I've been thinking, I'm not sure I've really done anything. But I have done a couple of good things. And uh, that is to hire people who fill all my, the gaps that I have. And I uh, want to say thank you to Paul. I can't tell you how often he and I have made jokes at all of your expense, <laughs> privately, because it's how we deal with <laughs> how insane this place can be sometimes. <laughs> Um, but he also pushes me to understand the humanity of, of everybody and what they bring, what their emotional needs are, and how we can figure out a way to come together. I want to say thank you to Nuchi Vang for being an incredible source of connection and glue. You make me do things I don't want to do every single day, and I never get upset about it. <laughs> Will Blavel uh, is here, is not here, but he also makes me do things every single day, and I very often get upset about it, and that's why I hired him, because he makes me do the stuff I don't want to do at all. Often I sit in uh, meetings and I think, what is my purpose here? I have this incredible group of people, I have these amazing legislators who make these incredible speeches, do all this wonderful policy work, a leader who has uh, the good of the whole in her heart every single time there is an issue, and I think, I guess I just figured out how to be around the right people. So, Madam Speaker and members, I want us to close by thanking a few people. Uh, we've stood many, many times to recognize our front desk staff, and it is time for us to do it again today. Thank you. Keep standing. We have to thank Patrick McCormick and the House Research Department. We have remarkable nonpartisan staff. We need to recognize Emily Adrians and the House Fiscal Staff. I don't know how they do that work. Ryan Inman and the revisers team. I don't know exactly how that happens. It's remarkable, and you have kept us going time after time after time. At the end of a session, when you perform superhuman feats uh, to keep these bills going, thank you to all of the revisers team. And with that, Madam Speaker, I want to make one final announcement, uh, and that is that there are refreshments served outside the front doors, uh, and the loggia is open. We have a few uh, uh, minutes this afternoon to enjoy some time together, and I have a final uh, set of motions to make. Uh, and the Chief Clerk, if you could please read the motion. Of course. <laughs> Motions and resolutions. Winkler moves that the chief clerk be, and he is hereby instructed to inform the Senate and the governor by message that the House of Representatives is about to adjourn this 90-second session sine die. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, members, uh, this will let the Senate know that we are going home for now. We should also send a, an accompanying message telling them to show back up because we have more work to do. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that the House adjourn sine die. Representative Winkler moves that the House adjourn sine die. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. please say no. Aye. The motion prevails. The House is adjourned sine die.